The subject of my talk was inspired by the genocide warning issued by CSI and uh, by John concerning the Christians of the Middle East in particular. And so I will focus on religious freedom and the United Nations role in Egypt, Iraq, and Syria. Uh, the title of my talk, as I've said, is The Legacy of the Ottoman Empire's Genocide and Its Implications for Current Events. There has been a tendency of late to look to Turkey as a model or a miracle economically or politically that can inspire democratic change in places that have been dictatorships for many years, such as Egypt, Iraq, and Syria. Uh, Turkey's role within the United Nations is a special one, and I believe that its role has particular implications for anti-genocide activism and for international law. There is a pattern of uh, voting within the United Nations linked to Turkey that I will get to, and that manifested itself among other times with no real United Nations inquiry into the plight of Iraqi minorities in the 1980s or 1990s, uh, and for a, a minimal inquiry in the 2000s. So I believe that legal reforms are needed within the United Nations to promote a universal application of norms guaranteeing religious freedom and the prohibition against genocide. And I'll talk about those legal norms at, at the conclusion of my presentation. The trend since the Arab Spring. We've seen a trend of a shift from protests to rebellions. Uh, in Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Yemen, and Syria, what began as street protests, graffiti, uh, marching with signs, shouting slogans, uh, asking for change, uh, after confronted by regime repression, has turned into violence against governments, burning down buildings, uh, setting fires, attacking security personnel, trying to occupy buildings. Uh, these rebellions have then been followed by interventions. There was the intervention of the international community demanding um, on the part of many countries that Egypt's dictator resign. There was the Security Council resolution and NATO intervention in Libya. There were the mediations between uh, Yemen's political factions to uh, facilitate the ouster of the government and a change towards a more inclusive system. And uh, the current set of Security Council resolutions and Human Rights Council resolutions and inquiries regarding Syria and the debate that we've seen this week regarding should there be more aggressive uh, military aid and, um, and arms embargo on the Syrian government. After these interventions, we've also seen a pattern of reprisals, reprisals against members of the regime and members against ethnic and religious groups believed to be friendly or formerly friendly with the regime. So in Libya, we've seen attacks on uh, government officials and ethnic groups believed to be tied to the Gaddafi regime. Uh, in Syria, we've seen chants against ethnic groups tied to the government, uh, and ethnic groups believed not to have joined the rebellion soon enough. Uh, and in both of these cases, uh, commentators and scholars have seen um, or mentioned the memories of Iraq, where widespread reprisals followed the uh, transition from a dictatorship to a um, UN, US supervised uh, series of elections and constitution drafting process. And during those reprisals, many thousands of peoples were killed. And finally, we see a trend of reprisals to constitutions. So the idea is that this trend towards reprisals against the regime and, and ethnic or religious groups seen to be friendly with the regime could be halted by an inclusive and democratic secular constitution. Uh, or perhaps partially secular constitution in guaranteeing religious freedom. Uh, and in many of these uh, debates or discussions, uh, the United States in particular, its officials have looked to Turkey as a model of uh, a constitutional democracy in the Middle East um, with religious diversity and uh, that can be emulated uh, by its neighbors in the region. Um, there is a belief that some of the chaos that we've seen in Egypt and Libya could be moderated by the adoption of, of new constitutions that guaranteed pluralism. Uh, so I'm going to raise some questions about this latter narrative that uh, Turkey stands as a model that can be emulated by uh, Iraq, Egypt, and Syria to promote pluralism, democracy, and secularism in the Middle East. What are the linkages between the Ottoman Empire, the Armenian Genocide, and what we're seeing today? Well, there are physical links many times. Uh, Christians of the Ottoman Empire, and particularly the Anatolian Christians, fled from 
Anatolia to Iraq, Syria, and other places uh, where officials were more tolerant. Uh, the um, British and the French intervened. And uh, many survivors and descendants of genocide victims from the 1914 to 1923 period have lived in, and have had families and grandchildren in, in um, Iraq and Syria. There are also links between uh, Turkey materially to other genocides. Uh, so, for example, Turkey has been a prominent defender of Sudan on the issue of genocide in the Darfur region, uh, as has Saudi Arabia. In Saudi Arabia, Turkey and the Arab League have acted in concert uh, in defending President al-Bashir of Sudan against charges of genocide in Sudan. In Egypt, we see that Turkey has been outspoken in its support for um, Mohamed Morsi, despite a pattern of impunity against uh, impunity for attackers of the Coptic community and Coptic, Coptic churches. We also see a, a linkage to genocide between Saudi Arabia and Iraq. The massive arms flows funded by Saudi Arabia in the 1980s uh, helped Iraq perpetrate its genocide against the Kurds in the north. And continuing flows of funds and weapons from Saudi Arabia to Iraq have funded what the Iraqi government has called a new genocide against Shiite and Kurdish and uh, Assyrian Christian communities in Iraq as rebels uh, mount massive bombings of civilian targets. Uh, and finally, we have the linkage between Turkey and Saudi Arabia to Libya and Syria. And in both cases, Turkey and Saudi Arabia were outspoken in urging a blockade of the government and uh, massive aid to the rebel forces, which led to the fall uh, of the government in whole or in part, in whole in Libya, in part in Syria. Uh, and there's been a, a pattern of toleration of the rebels' crimes against Africans in the case of Libya, seen to be friendly with the government in Gaddafi's time, and Christians in Syria uh, seen to be insufficiently friendly to the rebels uh, today. I view in my scholarship the Middle Eastern Christians not simply as a religious minority, but as the indigenous peoples of the region. So the context for this is the conquest of historic Assyria and Armenia by first the Arabs and then the Turks. So in the first millennium of the Common Era, uh, we see the Arab conquest of historic Assyria. And in the early second millennium of the Common Era, we see the Turkish conquest of Armenia. Uh, it is this act of conquest that defines what an indigenous people is under international law. Under international law, an indigenous people is a people that enjoys some form of continuity with a pre-invasion society. Uh, the members of that people see themselves as distinct from other sectors of the society and form a non-dominant sector of society that is attempting to preserve its cultural and religious institutions uh, against the ethnic and cultural and national institutions of the conquering race or religion. Uh, so who are some of these indigenous peoples? Uh, the Copts are often referred to by their own leaders and by scholars as the indigenous people of Egypt. Uh, their name um, is the Greek word for Egypt, and there are about 8 to 10 million Copts today, depending on who you listen to. Uh, the Greeks. There are a very small number of Greeks today, but uh, Anatolia was uh, <coughs> largely a Greek area, uh, certainly in the Black Sea and uh, Aegean coast, um, prior to the Turkish conquest, and even in some cases uh, prior to 1925. Uh, and there are also a large number of Greek Christians or Greek church-affiliated Christians in Syria. Uh, the Assyrians, we have today about 18,000 in Turkey, uh, 600,000 in Syria, and 550,000 in Iraq. Uh, the Yazidis, uh, there are elements scholars have noted of the ancient Assyrian religion in Yazidi practices, and there are 500,000 of them in Iraq and 5,000 in Turkey. The Armenians, 65,000 remaining today in Turkey and 15,000 in Iraq. And the Mandeans, less often known like the Yazidis, uh, there are remnants of Babylonian and Assyrian religion in their practices, and they are today largely found in Iraq, a few in Iran. Now, if we look at the uh, statistics regarding the size of Christian populations in the Middle East, we notice uh, a great statistical disparity. In Saudi Arabia and Turkey, the percentage is far below 1% of the population remains Christian. Saudi Arabia claims that 100% of the population is uh, is Muslim, although of course there are Western expats and so forth. Turkey, the, uh, the government and foreign observers uh, say that the only 0.2% of the population is Christian, Jewish, Hindu, Yazidi, or other. Uh, in Iraq, the figure is more than 10 times as great proportionally to Turkey. It's 3%. And in Iran, it's 2%. Syria, 
10% uh, and Lebanon, of course, much higher. So we see the, the legacy of the Ottoman Empire's genocide in these statistics so that Iraq and Syria and Lebanon have a much greater percentage of their Orthodox Christian population surviving today uh, than Turkey and certainly than Saudi Arabia. So one reason to question whether Turkey is a model for these multi-ethnic, multi-religious states like Egypt, Iraq, and Syria today is that the history of Turkey is one in which millions of the Christian subjects of the Ottomans were ruthlessly driven en masse from their homes and massacred. Uh, those are not my words. Those are the words of the, the founder of modern Turkey, Mustafa Kemal. Uh, in the words of the U.S. ambassador, there was a devilish scheme to annihilate the Armenian, Greek, and Syrian Christians of Turkey. So they were, the, the Christians were annihilated in, in large part. The German ambassador, of the, uh, German ambassador to the Ottoman Empire spoke of an attempt to kill or expel everything that is not Turkish. And the German diplomat in Mosul said, undoubtedly Christians have been outlawed from the Ottoman Empire. Let's look at the Turkish model then economically. Sometimes it is said that, well, while the country is not very diverse and there is a legacy of persecution, uh, it's an economic miracle. I also question whether it's really an economic miracle or model for other countries in the region. The life expectancy is only 44, 74, which is worse than Bosnia or Tunisia. And the life expectancy is 71 or less in the southeast, which is worse than Jordan, Libya, or Syria. So why should countries that are actually further ahead than parts of Turkey look to Turkey as a model? The infant mortality rate in 2008 was worse than in Belarus or Cuba, not looked to as economic models by any means. The under five mortality rate, 50% worse than Syria, four times worse than Israel. The real GDP per capita uh, in Mardin and the southeast, it's more like Angola than a modern developed Western uh, democracy. Uh, the real GDP per capita was 2,500 or less in the Mardin region in the year 2000. So economically, the country is not particularly a model either. If you look at the Human Development Index, we see that the life expectancy at birth in many regions is considerably below the West Bank, which is not exactly a model for human development. Uh, and the real GDP per capita in the Mardin area in 2000 was lower than that of Namibia. So not exactly a model economically either. Uh, we look at the percentage of the population that is Christian, look at the, an indicia of the diversity of Turkey. Uh, the Armenian, Greek, and Assyrian population of Turkey represents a lower percentage than the Jewish population represents in Germany. That is how much the uh, Christian minority has been suppressed and destroyed in Turkey or expelled. Uh, so while Jews are a quarter of a percent of the German population in 2006, Armenians were less than a tenth of a percent of the Turkish population, Greeks less than a hundredth of a percent, and Assyrians also less than a tenth of a percent. We see reports in the international media starting in 1914 but continuing in, until this day of attempts to suppress the Christian and uh, ethnically non-Turkish identities of the uh, people of Turkey. Um, the Armenian population, of course, declined by more than 80% between the start of World War I and the end, the Assyrian population similarly declined to an even lower absolute number than the Armenian. We see ruined churches across Turkey. Uh, the Armenian scholars claim that more than 1,600 churches, uh, either monastic churches or, or parish or city churches, uh, were destroyed or, or vandalized uh, in World War I and in the 1920s. Uh, we see landscapes like this in Turkey, uh, in the vicinity of Van, where um, cities have been razed to the ground that were majority Christian and do not exist anymore. You can look to a, a large number of these towns and cities that have been either destroyed or had their uh, ethnic and racial composition forever changed by this uh, Ottoman genocide. Uh, this is just a map of eastern Anatolia to give you a sense of some of these regions. Uh, we see the abandonment of the spiritual headquarters of the Assyrians in eastern Turkey. This is the former uh, spiritual capital of Kuchanis, of the Assyrians. Uh, and we see the low level of development in the east as well. We see homes that look like this. Uh, not exactly an economic model in the east of Turkey, uh, which are the areas adjoining um, Iraq and Syria, of course. Um, Armenian and Assyrian lands are often mined with landmines. Uh, almost a million landmines in the east, concentrated in the east, but in other places as well, as of the end of uh, uh, 2007. Uh, so 
even if people wanted to return and redevelop these churches and villages, they could not do it because oftentimes the, 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 the land has been mined and you receive a warning if you try to drive into that area or walk uh, that you could run into a landmine. Turkey Syriacs denied the right to their own names. A man applied to uh, the Constitutional Court in Turkey in 2011 uh, to change his name to a Syriac or to a Christian name. Uh, denied. It's illegal under the Turkish surname law. Uh, the names of places have been changed in Turkey from Armenian, Greek, Jewish, and uh, Arabic, and Assyrian, and Kurdish names to Turkish names. This was a law in the 1930s uh, and a practice uh, in the 1950s and, and going forward. What happened in the region after the fall of the Ottoman Empire? Of course, many of the former Ottoman domains gained independence. Uh, first, oftentimes going through a mandate period and then enjoying independence. So we see this period of gaining independence from the 1920s until the 1950s. We see a transition from monarchies to republics um, in Egypt in 1952, in Iraq in 1958, in Afghanistan in 1973, in Iran in 1979. We see a transition from monarchy to republic. Of course, of course not all those are being Ottoman domains, but it illustrates the general trend of republicanism. Then we see a further trend starting in 1980 with uh, going from republics to religious regimes. So in Iran, an early period in which it seemed like there might be a democracy, there might be a multi-party state, transitioned to a religious government in 1980. In Sudan in 1989, a religious government took power. In Afghanistan in 1992, a religious government. In Turkey in 2003, a religious party gains the majority. In Iraq in 2004, a religious party uh, comes to the fore. Uh, in Gaza in 2006, a religious party gains control of Gaza. Uh, in Egypt in 2012, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood and allied parties win the election. Uh, and then in Syria in 23 is a question mark. Will that be the next transition to a religious government in this pattern? This is just an article saying how um, in Iran there was a lot of hope by opposition leaders that there would be a democracy in 1980. Of course, those hopes were dashed. Scholars have called this trend towards religious regimes Talibanization. It's a process, of course, going on in Afghanistan, also in Pakistan. Uh, and it leads towards wider conflict. Conflict spreads like a virus from country to country as extremists go from country to country, learning, uh, using their uh, lessons from the first country to destabilize and uh, transition the next country to a religious government. And this has caused mass refugee flight. Uh, first of all, in Afghanistan, uh, now in Pakistan, uh, certainly in Iraq, and now in Syria and Libya and other places. Uh, Another reason why Turkey is praised as a model in the region is that it brings peace and stability to the neighborhood. That is what Secretary of State Hillary Clinton said about Turkey. It brings peace and stability to the neighborhood. Um, I question that, having studied the region. Um, for example, in the former Yugoslavia, there were up to 300,000 excess deaths as Turkey supported a rebellion uh, centered in Bosnia and then centered in Kosovo against the federal government. It caused a massive civil war, refugee flight, and the disintegration of the polity. Uh, in Iraq, not exactly a stable area. Of course, Turkey is not, not to blame for it, but peace and stability in the region has not been uh, present. Uh, if we look at refugees from major wars in 2011, uh, three of the largest refugee populations, according to UNHCR, were Iraq, Libya, and Syria. Um, Turkey had a very prominent role in both Libya and Syria, uh, causing those conflicts to come about in 2011 and those refugees to flee. Uh, and the other um, conflicts in the region, Turkey has also played a part in. In Afghanistan, um, supporting the rebels in the 1980s. Uh, in Iraq, uh, supporting the transition in the United Nations. Um, and in Sudan, defending the government of Sudan against charges of genocide and, and uh, undemocratic practices. Just one headline, 1,500 people drowned or go missing trying to cross the Mediterranean from North Africa in 2011. Not exactly peace and stability in the neighborhood. Iraq is also looked to as a model by some for the Arab Spring countries, for Libya and Syria in particular. People say that Iraq managed its transition from a dictatorship to a democracy. Maybe it is a model for Libya and Syria. I also question whether this is a, an attractive model. Uh, studies have shown there have been up to 1 million excess deaths in Iraq compared to the pre-war mortality rates. Uh, the ethnic violence is such that you can see it from space, with the lighting of different neighborhoods changing as people flee. 4.5 million refugees and internally displaced people. Perhaps 3 million widows, according to the relevant government ministry. Child malnutrition reaching almost a third. Children not able to eat. Nearly half of the population was living on a dollar a day at one point. It was tied with Burma for the second most corrupt country in the world. 
people stealing money. It was in the top 10 unhappiest nations in 2008. So again, not exactly a successful model for Libya, Syria, or Egypt to follow. There was also widespread religious targeting in Iraq. Half of the Assyrian population has fled. The Christian population has fled Iraq. Uh, in a few notable instances, 2,000 families fled Mosul in October 2008 in the lead up to another election. Uh, there was a, a campaign of death threats and targeted assassinations. In 2009, six churches were bombed in Baghdad in a single day uh, or a single month. In 2009, three churches in a convent bombed in Mosul. Uh, and the United States has reported that very few of the perpetrators of these crimes have been punished in 2009, 2010. Not a model of peace, stability, rule of law, or democracy, in my judgment. The US Congress has passed a resolution about the minorities in Iraq, said that uh, according to the US Commission on International Religious Freedom, there are grave threats to religious freedom in Iraq, particularly for the smallest religious minorities, including Chaldeans, Syriacs, Assyrians, and other Christians, Sebian, Mandeans, and Yazidis. The report also said, or the resolution said, there have been alarming numbers of religious me, religiously motivated killings, abductions, rapes, uh, displacement from homes, and so on. Just a few images of this violence, uh, debris from the bombing of St. George Church in Baghdad in 2004, uh, other church bombing sites in Iraq. This was a large one in Kirkuk, uh, somewhat more recently. There was a map published a few years ago on, on the blog Healing Iraq of uh, the ethnic and religious comp composition of different neighborhoods of Baghdad. And they noted that the Dora district in, in the southern part uh, was an area of Christian majority, at least at first. That has changed. Uh, the Christians were largely driven out of Dora in 2010, if not before. Uh, and television reporters who've been there found uh, their churches and neighborhoods to be largely abandoned or replaced by people who came in from other parts of the city because there was ethnic cleansing and religious cleansing throughout the city. The Mandeans have been hit particularly hard by uh, the widespread violations of human rights and religious freedom in Iraq. These are just pictures of Mandean um, religious practices, ritual washings, uh, reminiscent of ancient Mesopotamia. Uh, according to the Mandean Human Rights Group in 2005, a recent surge in religious extremism, extremism made Mandean lives even worse. Uh, it's a combination of a general lawlessness in Iraq, the fact that Mandeans carry no weapons, and the fact that extremist clerics have declared that it's religiously acceptable to take money, property, and women from infidels. So, sort of express incitement uh, and encouragement of violence against the Mandeans, this very small, vulnerable community. Uh, the Yazidis, uh, complain of a similar uh, pattern. This is an, a, a Yazidi leader from northern Iraq. Uh, this is a Yazidi uh, historic site, a uh, temple. Uh, an article in the Kurdish Globe, uh, although Yazidis are flocking for their uh, pilgrimage to Lalish, uh, they were victims of uh, a bombing that killed 500 Yazidis in a, se a single incident. So a massive massacre, the likes of which is larger than anything seen in Kosovo or, or many other suspected cases of genocide. Um, and the, the Yazidi interviewed in the article is saying, uh, we can't even travel to Mosul anymore for education or go to the hospital because it's so dangerous. Extremists have taken over Mosul and we can't go there. This is in 2010. Uh, what is Turkey's role as all this violence has raged? Um, even in the dictatorship period of Iraq, the Arab League and Turkey did not clearly condemn Iraq for violence against the Kurds and the minorities of Iraq. Uh, the Arab League also opposed, as I said before, the International Criminal Court arrest warrant for al-Bashir. Uh, they supported the suspension of Libya and Syria from the Arab League for violating human rights, but there's been no suspension of Iraq for the anti-Assyrian killings of the recent years or the anti-Kurd killings of the 1980s. So killings on a much larger scale than anything in Libya, much more displacement uh, as a percentage of the population, not followed by a suspension, an effective resolution, or any kind of intervention. So, uh, and of course, Turkey and the Arab League gave much more material support to the Libyan uh, and Syrian rebellions uh, than to any efforts to safeguard the uh, autonomy or rights of the Assyrian or Kurdish population of Iraq. Um, two Turkish scholars have said that Turkey created a new language on Darfur in order to characterize Darfur as a conflict rather than a series of crimes. So Libya and Syria are a series of crimes, but Darfur and other cases where the violence is deemed acceptable is just a conflict. So there's this uh, malleability of language in, in Turkey's diplomacy. Uh, Rosa Friedman has, has done a number of stories on the UN Human Rights Council. 
Uh, and she argues that the organization of the Islamic Conference with 57 states is the largest voting bloc within the UN. And that the UN works on regional alliances based upon religious, ethnic, and geographic proximity. The only member lacking a regional alliance for this purpose is Israel. So that Israel drew as many condemnations from the UN human rights bodies as all other states combined. And the Israeli, Arab, and Southern African apartheid conflicts are the two most discussed within the UN. So there's been a neglect of human rights violations against the indigenous populations of Turkey, Iraq, Syria, other places. There's this disproportionate focus on Israel as a result of a voting bloc in which Turkey is a part. Justin Grunberg published an article in the Case Western Reserve Journal of International Law on UN Security Council resolutions. Prior to 1990, 23% of Security Council res resolutions were about Israel. Five resolutions spoke of a massacre of the Palestinians, and the only massacre mentioning a cri uh, the only massacre called criminal in the Security Council was in a resolution against Israel. So there were no criminal massacres in any other countries. Israel was warned about its practices on five different occasions during the Cold War while Colombia, Indonesia, Iraq, and Pakistan were not warned or did not receive a warning, despite the fact that in all those countries, hundreds of thousands of people were killed in ethnic violence, and in Pakistan, more than a million in 1971. Israel was the subject of more than two-thirds of censures by the Security Council, a country being censured for its practices. Um, Turkey was not warned or censured, despite ethnically cleansing half of Cyprus of everything that is Greek or looked Greek, including the people that were Greek. Iraq was not warned or censured, despite the Anfal campaign. The Security Council never addressed Saddam's crimes against humanity in a resolution. Saudi Arabia has not been warned for funding extremists in Iraq who've attacked so many people. So there's been a, a systemic bias in the Security Council and the Human Rights Council uh, in favor of certain countries and against other countries, largely based upon regional, ethnic, and religious alliances. What are the implications of this for the present day? Like I said before, there's been a transition away from these five leaders, dictators, uh, in favor of we're not sure exactly what. Uh, and these countries actually achieved quite a bit in terms of human development during the dictatorship period. If we look at female life expectancy in 1989, it compares favorably, favorably to the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, the supposed economic powerhouses of the, of the 2000s. Um, female life expectancy in India still has not reached the level of Tunisia, Iraq, Libya, or Syria in the dictatorship period. Armed conflicts in 2011, we see a band going from Turkey all the way down to Cambodia, a band of armed conflict and instability. It also includes Russia and North Africa now. Uh, Egypt is where, of course, the Arab Spring began. People began setting themselves on fire to protest corruption, dictatorship, and lack of democracy. A day of rage was planned with 90,000 people signing up on Facebook. Uh, soon after that, a police station was destroyed in Suez. Uh, the Interior Ministry was subject to a sustained assault. Uh, soon after that, President Obama asked President Mubar Mubarak to leave office. The Supreme Council of Armed Forces took power in a coup shortly thereafter, and the Copts have largely suffered uh, in the aftermath. Um, actually, before the Arab Spring began, there was the Alexandria Church Massacre, and some scholars have speculated there could be some connection between this and that, the bombing of the Alexandria Church. Uh, in April 2011, there were demands that Christians who had gained uh, high office under Mubarak all be removed. Uh, we saw the same thing in Sudan in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, in May 2011, 10 people were killed in the destruction of St. Mina Church. In October 2011, there was a burning of a church in Aswan. In October 2011, of course, there was a Maspero massacre of the Copts. And in January 2012, Copts fled attacks by 3,000 people organized in El Ameria. Uh, what is Turkey's role in all this? Well, uh, Tayyip Erdogan congratulated Mohamed Morsi for becoming the leader of Turkey in June 2012. Uh, the US Commission on International Religious Freedom reported that for that year, 2012, there had been impunity for attacks on Copts. Religious scholars were going to write legislation instead of civilly trained judges. Polytheism and the Baha'i religion were to be constitutionally banned, and cops were being disproportionately prosecuted for blasphemy and other crimes. There was a famous Facebook blasphemy trial, and there will be many others. Uh, the Coptic Church condemned uh, this past April the first time in the history of Egypt that an attack took place directly on the headquarters of the Coptic Church because the government failed in protecting and securing the cathedral as it had done in the time of Mubarak. Uh, 
Uh, what is Turkey's role in Libya? In March 7, 2011, uh, Erdogan recognized the rebels of Libya as a legitimate government. Turkey provided $100 million in funding to the rebels. Uh, Turkish arms and funding were followed by um, Saudi and other uh, funds. Uh, Turkey, Libya, Saudi Arabia then joined together to arm the Syrian rebels in 2011. Uh, oil pipelines have been bombed in Syria. 500 Syrian soldiers and security officers were dead by July 2011. 2,000 of them had died by the end of 2011. It was reported in fall of 2011 that 600 Libyan rebels were in Syria leading the rebellion. In October, it was reported that those same Libyan rebels were systematically killing and torturing non-Arab Africans in Libya. The town of Tawarga, which was deemed to be friendly to Gaddafi, was left an abandoned ghost town. These are the people who are going to Syria to lead the rebellion there. Uh, by January 2012, Turkey and Jordan between them harbored 22,000 rebels who were aiming their fire at Syria. The, the Libyan Islamic fighter, fighting group leaders spearheaded the Syrian rebellion, according to the press, uh, and their leadership was hailed by Al-Qaeda Central in, in a public communication. Uh, also in 2012, the Free Syrian Army warned of huge operations, and there was a formal merger between Al-Qaeda in Iraq and Al-Qaeda in Syria uh, to form a greater um, rebellious entity. The Human Rights Council has been very much focused on Syria, it just has been focused on Palestine. Syria has sort of taken up its role next to Palestine uh, as a subject that Turkey wants to be heard and therefore will be heard. Uh, Syria and Palestine between them have received four times as many special sessions of the Human Rights Council as Darfur, which suffered 450,000 plus deaths, excess deaths from both violence and hunger and disease. Um, other conflicts that only had one special session of the Human Rights Council, Democratic Republic of Congo, Haiti, Lebanon, Myanmar, and Sri Lanka. There was only, and there were a few other um, topical special sessions of the Human Rights Council, and zero on the situation in Egypt, Iran, uh, southeastern Turkey, uh, Yemen, um, South Asia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Southern Africa had zero sessions, and Central America had zero sessions. So the Security Council, in, in the view of many scholars, like Grunberg, has, has a series of double standards. Israel has been deplored or condemned for cases involving the deaths of as few as four individuals. Four, five, or 12 Palestinian individuals warrants a, a condemnatory Security Council resolution, but we see much higher death tolls among cops, Assyrians, Kurds, Yazidis, 500 Yazidis, uh, Mandeans, no resolution. Uh, the Hebron massacre of 1994 was called a massacre five times by the Security Council, even though the government of Israel didn't do it. Uh, at the same time, massacres by the government in Iranian and Turkish prisons were not mentioned. The Mas Barrow massacre was not mentioned. The Assyrians have never been mentioned in any context by the Security Council. The cops have never been mentioned, or at least not in recent times, uh, similarly with the, the Shiites of Afghanistan, the Hazaras, or the Yazidis of Iraq. Um, Iraq was not condemned or deplored like Israel was in the 1980s, uh, despite the fact of um, the chemical gas attacks against Iranians, against Kurds. Halabja was not mentioned in the Security Council. The Abu Ghraib prison massacre of 1998 was not mentioned. Uh, so there's been a series of failures by the Security Council to timely condemn, prevent, and punish massacres against minorities in the Middle East, including in particular the Christians, but not strictly the Christians. Could these massacres rise to the level of genocide? Well, according to Turkey, they could. The Turkish government has condemned far smaller or, and more limited massacres of Muslims as genocide than we've seen in some of these Middle Eastern conflicts. In Cyprus, in the, pre, in the uh, prelude to their intervention, they called that a genocide of the Turkish population of Cyprus. In Bosnia, they claimed of genocide in 1991 and 1992, uh, as the rebellion was just getting started. In Kosovo, after a massacre of 24 people, they called that a genocide. In East Turkestan, China, in recent years, Turkey called that a genocide when there were a series of riots and uh, security officers killed rioters. Um, Israel's actions in Palestine, Turkey is called genocide. So things that impacted the population in a much smaller proportionate share than Assyrians have been impacted, and certainly than Kurds have been impacted, have been called genocide by the Turkish government um, and not these other cases. What are the warning signs for genocide? When should we think that these massacres are transitioning into a genocide? 
Scholars have identified a number of warning signs. Uh, civil war, the number one warning sign. We saw it in Rwanda, we saw it in Bosnia, we saw it in Cambodia, we've seen it in many places. Formation of clandestine death squads. Um, the special organization in the case of the Ottoman Empire, Einsatzgruppen in the case of Germany and Austria, um, other cases of death squads. Uh, demonization of groups, blaming them for the country's problems, saying that they're to blame is a warning sign. Institutionalized inequality between different groups. So for example, the constitution promotes one group or another, or one group historically has had power over the other. Upcoming elections uh, are an excuse or a trigger for genocide in many cases. Competition for land and resources. Undue concentration of political power in an undemocratic system. Censorship of the mass media so that warning signs do not get out. Celebration of past genocides and crimes against humanity. And misuse of humanitarian aid are all warning signs of genocide and politicide. Do we see any of these warning signs coming to pass, such as demonization or incitement or, or formation of death squads? Uh, there's an accusation that the military council in Egypt is ignoring the church bombing cases, that uh, the perpetrators are enjoying impunity in Egypt, Egypt for church bombings. Uh, that's a troubling sign. This is an image of the attack on St. Mina Church in Cairo. Uh, the fire engines did arrive eventually, or some kind of water, but uh, at least 10 people were killed in that attack. Coptic homes set ablaze, another example. Uh, this is a picture of the church in Aswan, St. George's Church. Double standard in the contempt of religion law in Egypt. Uh, the non-Coptic population are free to insult and criticize each other in Facebook and on television and many other places. But if a cop does it, even by telling a joke, it's, it's a blasphemy case. So it's a discriminatory application of the law. Syria. What about warning signs in Syria? Well, there are a transition, as I said, from um, minor protests and, and minor killings of protesters to major protests and major killings of protesters. Uh, to major conflicts and all-out civil war, as we see in Aleppo and Damascus and other places. Uh, this is from the early stages of the Arab Spring in Syria, uh, the destruction of a government building. Al-Qaeda-backed Syrian revolt, um, a form of incitement, demonization of the opposition, uh, calling the regime cancerous. Uh, fighters and weapons are flowing into the Syrian war zone. A civil war is underway as uh, rebels are coming in from Iraq and from Libya, are crossing in from Turkey and waging war with AK-47s, hand grenades, heavy machine guns, mortars, and anti-armor missiles. Some scholars are speaking of an Afghanistization of Syria, that Syria will become like Afghanistan. And it's, it's not a very uh, inspiring model. More than 500,000 Afghan civilians died in the civil war of the 1990s. There have been more than, arguably more than two million deaths overall in Afghanistan since 1979. The life expectancy was only 44 in 2009 versus 72 in Syria. It was the only country outside of Sub-Saharan Africa with an under mortality rate of more than 10%. So one in 10 children dying before the age of five. And the GDP per capita was only $500 despite billions of dollars of international aid. So the place is also impoverished. What are the UN responses and how can we reform the UN to prevent these warning signs of genocide from evolving into actual genocide? Well, there are various stages of UN involvement. There can be concern and condemnation, censure. Uh, there can be an offer of peacekeepers where the sides agree they won't attack the peacekeepers, but they will let them keep the peace. There can be a referral to the International Criminal Court, and then there can be an authorization of the use of military force. Outside of that, many of the uh, interventions that are being practiced are arguably illegal, according to many scholars. So uh, critics of Security Council involvement are saying that there's a deadly combination of sanctions on the government and arms to the rebels that violates norms of international law and creates a warning <coughs> sign of genocide in the form of civil war and radicalization of the population. There's also an argument in cases like Libya that authorizations for the use of force that were provided by the Security Council were exceeded. So that's what Russia argues about the Libyan resolution, that it authorized the protection of the people in Benghazi, and it was exceeded to um, support the coming to power of a particular group or set of groups. And there are double standards, of course, in various situations. There have been referrals of some cases to the ICC, but not others. Uh, 
authorizations for the use of force in some cases, but not others. So there's a problematic pattern of lack of objectivity and universality in UN resolutions. So for example, while Israel has drawn the most condemnations by the United Nations for 100 deaths in Palestine in 2012 and about 800 in Gaza in 2008, there were more than 7,000 in Sri Lanka in 2009, not censured, not condemned, no resolution to the International Criminal Court or referral to the International Criminal Court. In 1991, during the suppression of the Kurdish and, and Shia uprisings, more than 50,000 people were killed. No referral to any court, no uh, intervention. Um, well, there was a kind of intervention, but uh, it, it didn't save the victims. Uh, political violence in Algeria killed more than 200,000 people. No referral, no clear condemnation. Uh, as I said, in Afghanistan, the civil war, uh, the victims of Darfur uh, have not received a uh, an answer from the International Criminal Court to their appeals for a trial, um, and the case in Iraq, not clearly condemned despite huge numbers of excess deaths. There's been no cooperation with the International Criminal Court in the Darfur case. Uh, the leader of Sudan travels to other countries and enjoys diplomatic relations with other countries without um, being clearly sanctioned. The cases of Libya, Cote d'Ivoire, Kenya, the DRC and the Central African Republic are moving forward in the, in the International Criminal Court involving dozens of victims in some cases or hundreds of victims, whereas the Darfur case involves hundreds of thousands of victims and it's not being pursued. Human Rights Watch is calling for Syria and Sri Lanka and Gaza to join these other situations, but it has not been done. Uh, there's nothing in the International Criminal Court on Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Somalia, Colombia, Rwanda, or Saudi-sponsored violence in any of the cases I've described. So there's a, a pattern of inaction, double standards, and incongruity in the referrals to the National Criminal Court and in the Security Council's responses. What is the legal solution to this problem, this pattern of, of double standards? Uh, number one, we could reform the International Criminal Court. We could decouple it from Security Council referrals and we could speed up its process so that Darfur would receive as speedy uh, an indictment uh, and a process as Libya is receiving for, for much smaller crimes. Uh, and we could also achieve universality and non-discrimination in the International Criminal Court so that both sides of a conflict, if they commit crimes, may be referred and not simply the losing side or the side that is less popular uh, in some kind of voting block. Scholars talk about UN reform with more representation from the de developing world, reducing the influence of the Arab League and the Permanent Five in the Security Council and in other uh, UN agencies, having greater transparency and publicizing of draft resolutions so that the public can make its voice known, and enforcing human rights more effectively in the middle zone between condemnation and a Libyan-style intervention, so that you, you don't need to overthrow the entire government to have a remedy for human rights violations. And there are models for this in the European Court of Human Rights and the International Court of Justice, with Congo suing Uganda and, you know, um, Germany and Italy having a case and so forth and so on, where you can have civil compensation or some kind of a, a cease and desist order, as in Bosnia versus Serbia, without having a um, perhaps ill-considered regime change that engenders even more crimes. Another series of legal solutions that is absolutely essential is access to and control over cultural property. International law talks about a right to preserve one's cultural heritage against forced assimilation, violence, deportation, and other kinds of pressure. So there should be an effective remedy for obtaining access to and repatriation of one's ceremonial objects and church buildings, as the Convention on Indigenous Peoples talks about. So some of these buildings that have been destroyed in Turkey or Egypt can someday be reclaimed by the relevant community. Um, a self-determination in cultural affairs is essential. A UN report has talked about a right to one's homeland not being violated. The UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People talks about a right of self-determination in social and cultural development, the right to maintain and strengthen a people's distinct political, legal, and cultural institutions. For example, as the Native Americans have institutions in the United States. The Native American Repatriation Act talks about returning cultural patrimony to the Native Americans from federal government holdings and museums and so forth and so on. That's a model for for enforcement of the Declaration on Indigenous Peoples. Compensation for the destruction of cultural heritage is important. The state has an obligation to make reparation for damage caused to all persons concerned, according to the International Court of Justice. Corporations who aid and abet violations of international law are increasingly being sued for damages. 
And there should be compensation for destruction of cultural property under the Geneva Convention, which talks about it as a war crime and can be the basis of civil reparations, and under cases like Almog versus Arab Bank, which is a case in New York where Jewish victims of Palestinian suicide bombers are receiving compensation or hope to receive compensation for an extermination campaign against the Jewish race in Israel by the means of suicide bombing. There are potential objections to these legal reforms. Um, some scholars talk about it as cultural imperialism to say that the majority has to respect the minority. That's a Western model of liberalism that is criticized. There could be backlash from the majority, it is believed. There are oftentimes complex ownership issues with land and cultural objects, complex chains of title. Museums often make this argument. There could be an inhibition of scholarship and access if governments do not clearly control cultural relics. And there could be a Pandora's box of claims and counterclaims, one group against the other for reparations. Now, other scholars who study reparations say that you know, there does not necessarily have to be a significant backlash. There's not necessarily a huge backlash in the United States to the, the modest efforts that have been attempted to achieve reparations to the Native Americans. In Germany, there were substantial reparations to the Jews without huge backlash. In Guatemala, they are increasing reparations to the Mayan population for genocide in the 1980s without a huge backlash. In South Africa, there have been reparations to the black population without a violent backlash or a large-scale violent backlash. And there are also internal movements within most of these countries towards autonomy and equality of the minority populations. So, of course, many of the countries that I'm talking about have signed on to these international covenants and treaties that require them to do these things. So it's not entirely an external imposition. Also, there are negative effects of continued cultural violence that should not be ignored. It, it tends to facilitate extremism when pluralism uh, is destroyed, is the argument of many scholars. And the existing inequities that these countries have are probably worse than having to remedy these inequities. In other words, that the, the cure will not be worse than the disease. So those are the legal solutions I look to for preventing and remedying uh, cultural and religious violence in the Middle East. Um, I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you.